We're very lucky to have a two-time Schaefer Grant awardee as our next speaker. So I'm going to introduce Yvonne O oh from the University of California, San Francisco. And Yvonne is doing research on neurodegeneration in the retinal ganglion cells. Well, you've been hearing a lot about retinal ganglion cells, a lot about uh, neurodegeneration. And um, not only does she receive funding from us, but she's been very successful in getting funding from the National Eye Institute and National Institutes of Health. So we're gonna hear from Yvonne about what the future holds. And Yvonne, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, thanks. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'm excited to share with you some of the promising research that's on the horizon. And I wanna say at the outset that I think the big take home message I wanna share with you all is that there are a lot of scientists and clinician scientists such as myself who are super dedicated to trying to find ways in which we can improve the lives of our glaucoma patients. And some of the work that I'm gonna to present to you, I can't present everything, um, so I apologize in advance if there's a, a treatment that you wanted to hear about or some research that you wanted to hear about that I don't get a chance to touch upon, but um, there's, just a, there's a lot of activity. It's an exciting time to be in glaucoma. I think this morning you probably heard about new drugs new uh, glaucoma surgeries. There's been a renaissance, renaissance, I feel like, in glaucoma. When I decided to enter the field, um, there's a kind of a running joke among glaucoma specialists that it's called glaucoma because it's like you're kind of induced into a sleep. But it, that's not the case anymore. It's a really, there's a lot of new people, young people coming into the field as well because they're excited by the prospect of improving the lives of glaucoma patients because there's still a lot to understand about glaucoma. So um, the four areas that I wanted to talk about today was rewiring in the retina. Um, this is an area that my lab is interested in, and I'll just try to touch briefly upon that, as well as uh, regeneration in the retina, and I'm gonna touch upon Adriana DiPolo's work, which, and she was a Schaefer awardee and won the Schaefer Prize just this last year for her exciting work in, on insulin. We'll talk a little bit about axon regeneration and what the challenges are there and what the progress has been made. Um, stem cells, I, I worked a little bit in this area. I don't currently actively work in this area, but I've been trying to follow along um, because it's a very exciting area. And then I thought I would just include a little bit about whole eye transplant. And I'll tell you, five to 10 years ago, or even when I started at the um, UCSF, all of this, I kind of thought, was a little bit of science fiction. Like, how are we really gonna be able to accomplish some of these goals? And the National Eye Institute has made one of its audacious goals, um, axonal regeneration and optic nerve regeneration. And I, I, I wanted to leave you, again, with the idea that there's a lot of excitement, a lot of work in these fields, um, but also at the same time with the understanding that we're still, there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay, so this is a um, picture of the retina that was drawn in 1904 by one of the forefathers of um, neuroanatomy, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And I put it up here in case any of you are gonna be in um, UNC or from Durham or Chapel Hill, I should say. That's where I did my fellowship. And this um, art museum is having this exhibit. Um, it's up, only open for one more month. Uh, I actually saw the exhibit when it was at NYU last year when I was at the American Glaucoma Society meeting because last year it was in New York City. But it's a beautiful exhibit and what's astounding to me is how much anatomic detail he was able to draw of the retina and of the cells of the retina. So the photoreceptors are the light sensing neurons, then some of the information gets processed by the bipolar cells as well, the, as well as other cells. And then finally that information is transmitted to the ganglion cells and the ganglion cells then extend their axons all the way from the retina to the brain. And in humans that's almost 50 millimeters. So it's a long distance to travel. Um, and a lot of the information you can think of it is, is the ganglion cell plays a super important role. It's basically the bottleneck of all that information that's um, being processed by the retina. How does the retina survey the world? I like this um, um, figure that's from one of, um, also a very important figure in, in our understanding of retinal biology, uh, Dick Masland, and here's Michael Jordan driving to the basket. And I think one um, concept I just wanted to share with you is that there are different subtypes of ganglion cells and they do different things. So for example, in the top, very top, these are cells that have um, an ability to tell differences in gradations of um, shading. 
you know, white versus gray versus darker shades. And you'll see here that this, um, this is sort of representing the apertures of those ganglion cells. So the ganglion cells might have large dendritic fields. They might have small uh, dendritic fiel fields. You, if you compare that to the second row, these look like they have larger apertures. And these cells are cells that can sense, these are ganglion cells that can sense movement. They, may, they are not able to sense what direction that movement's happening, but they can sense some movement. And then for these cells, for example, are able to sense a direction. They're direction selective. So um, images in the, or, or stimuli in the visual field that are moving from, in this case, left to right, these cells will be able to sense. And then there's also blue, there's also color sensing abilities of some of our, or, uh, of some of our ganglion cells. So putting it all together, this is how one way that the retina surveys the world. And in, in the mouse, which is one of the experimental models we work in, there's thought to be at least 30 plus different types of ganglion cells. And we're still trying to figure out actually in humans how many types of ganglion cells are there really. And that's active ongoing work um, that um, multiple labs are working on, including my own. So this is a um, picture of a ganglion cell. Now you're looking at it on its face, on FOSS. And you're looking at the cell body. You're looking at the cell body here. And then here is its dendritic arbor, just this beautiful, beautiful dendritic tree. And these little balls that are on the um, sides here, these are representing of synapses. And synapses are the connections between neurons, how they communicate information. And so my lab's really interested in trying to understand what happens, what are some of the earliest changes that happen to the ganglion cell when it's injured? And potentially are there different types of ganglion cells that are more injured? And so I'll just really briefly take you through some of that. So as I mentioned, there are different types of ganglion cells. In this case, I'm just depicting a ganglion cell here that stratifies those dendrites in one layer of, that, of the retina. And then these ganglion cells go deeper within the retina. They're just at a different level. I forgot to tell you when I showed you that picture of that drawing of the retina that um, the cell bodies sit in one layer and then in between are the synaptic connections between the ganglion cells and the bipolar cells. Um, and so we can distinguish different types of ganglion cells based on where they put their dendrites. And then these pink cells and blue cells here, they, these are just representations of the bipolar cells. And then in between with these little balls are the synapses. So we were trying to figure out whether synapses were being lost first in glaucoma. We were trying to figure out whether or not different types of ganglion cells die first. We were looking at the, how big the dendritic field size was and what was happening to it after injury. And we were also looking at those synapses. And what we found is actually that there's a specific type of ganglion cell, the alpha off transient ganglion cell, that is selectively vulnerable in glaucoma. And this is work that one of the Catalyst for Cure um, members, Dr. Andy Huberman, who you saw earlier, um, his photo earlier, he also found this in a different model of um, mouse experimental glaucoma. Um, and so that was very reassuring because multiple labs were finding um, similar findings. And they also identified the alpha off transient ganglion cells selectively vulnerable. And so here I've just sort of uh, depicted that shrinkage of the large ganglion cell with the large dendritic arbor. And then over time, it loses the blue synapses and the dendritic arbor shrinks. And also it functions more poorly. And that the synapse loss is one of the first things that happens. It happens before you see shrinkage of the dendritic tree. A couple of big take home points in what we've been working on is that there, in the ganglion cell, there is synapse loss before dendritic pruning, which is what I just said, and that is helpful to know because we can track synapse loss um, as a very early biomarker in our models and then also hopefully in human retina. That's something that I'm actually uh, have a new postdoctoral fellow who's joined the lab and his whole project is gonna be to try to understand what's happening in uh, human retina. Um, and then um, the cell type specificity, which is that there are specific types of ganglion cells that are more selectively vulnerable in glaucoma. And then um, we've been looking specifically at bipolar cell inputs and how they behave in glaucoma. And I'm not going to get into that story, but uh, suffice it to, to say that's pretty, it's um, been really interesting. And then the last bit I'll just focus a little bit of attention on, and that's basically that a couple of things. The first is that we found that the synapses that the bipolar cells or the synaptic proteins that the bipolar cells had on the ganglion cell were being 
plucked off earlier than the, um, gang the synapses that, are, that belong to the ganglion cell. And this was really surprising to us. What I'm trying to say is, is that the proteins that were on the bipolar cells were being lost before the proteins that were on the ganglion cell. And that kind of was startling to me because I had always thought it's the ganglion cell that is primarily injured in glaucoma. If we're gonna look at these synaptic components, I'm sure, I thought, went into it thinking, I'm sure the, the ganglion cell is gonna lose its synapses first. But what we found actually is that the bipolar cell is somehow sensing that there's injury and plucking off its synaptic components. What that means and what that means for the disease, we are still trying to figure out, um, but it sort of shifted my mind a little bit about um, what, how the mechanism of glaucoma is working. And then the other thing to know about and is that all of the ganglion cells, they have their favorite partners. So what I mean by that is just like there are 30 plus types of retinal ganglion cells, there's also probably on the order of 12 to 15 bipolar cell types. And each ganglion cell type has its favorite partners. You know, we all have our favorite friends, the people we, like, we feel more akin with, and it's the same thing with the way the retina is wired. They're stereotyped connections. And what we found is that after injury, um, the preferred partner, that major partner, is what comes off of these ganglion cells. And we also see that there might actually be evidence of rewiring in the retina. So this is a particular ganglion cell type. It's called the alpha on sustained ganglion cell type. And it has a lot of connections with a particular bipolar cell type called the type six bipolar. And in the control retina, that's represented in blue, these little blue dots. And then after we induce elevated eye pressure in our model, which we do with a laser, what happens is as now in red, there's some connections with this new partner. This new partner, which actually we don't see normally in the adult. We see it during development. So during development, what happens is that new partners come onto the ganglion cells, and then when the development is done, the ganglion cell and the bipolar cell figure out which ones are the appropriate partners and get rid of like the, the partners that they don't need. And so during development, this particular represented by red, those uh, protein, those, those bipolar cell inputs have some interaction with this particular ganglion cell type, but by the time the animal reaches adulthood, there's no more of that partner. But what we're seeing after injury is that there's rewiring with that uh, previous partner, and that to me is pretty exciting. And some of the work that's been funded by um, the Glaucoma Research Foundation through that Schaefer Award is using ERG to look at the function of these ganglion cells. So ERG is a type of test, it's called electroretinography. It's not typically used in glaucoma diagnosis, although we actually, a lot of groups around the world have used different types of ERG stimuli to try to figure out whether or not we can use it to follow um, ganglion cell function and how well it's working. And it's an attractive test because instead of having to you know, use a, do a visual field, which depends on whether you're tired and how much attention you're paying, and it's frankly, it's kind of a boring test. Um, this is actually a very objective test. So there's an electrode that's placed in, in um, we have a study in the clinic where we're using skin electrodes, so there's nothing even on the eye. And then um, there's a stimulus that's presented, and the, as a patient, you don't have to do anything except to look straight ahead. Um, and that is a way in which we can um, measure function. So what the Glaucoma Research Foundation has been funding is a study in which we're looking at um, whether we can use novel stimuli to test those more vulnerable ganglion cell pathways versus the more resilient. And what I'm showing here is that um, initially, the ERG is depressed. This is called the uh, scotopic B wave, and this is in the glaucoma model. And then it recovers over time, over 30 days, which is what that time point was that I showed you there was some rewiring. So we think that some of that rewiring is helping the ganglion cell recover function. Okay, so um, I'll just briefly also touch upon some areas, other avenues that we're also translating our work into. One of those areas is psychophysics, so novel visual field stimuli to try to show that there are specific retinal microcircuits that might be more vulnerable in glaucoma. And this is actually a patient of mine who also volunteers with the Glaucoma Research Foundation. And what she's doing here is a type of visual field uh, measurement using a virtual reality platform with vivid vision. We have a collaboration with them. Um, and the 
test that she's doing is called oculokinetic perimetry. Instead of looking straight ahead, she's actually looking at the stimulus as it's being presented. So the patient doesn't have to just fixate, which is also very hard. It's hard to suppress our desire to look at the object that's being shown to us. So um, that was developed by Bertel D'Amato, who was at UCSF. He's actually an ocular oncologist, but had a long-standing interest in developed oculokinetic perimetry over 20 years ago. But now it's been put into this virtual reality platform, and what we'd like to do is also to develop novel stimuli that will test um, those selectively vulnerable ganglion cells. So I told you I would talk um, about uh, Dr. DiPolo's work. This is very exciting work, and I have patients ask me about this pretty regularly. And here, now that you've been introduced to the images of the retinal ganglion cells, you'll see here, just like in um, our model, she's using an exotomy model. That just means she's cutting the axon, cut, cutting the optic nerve. And so after you do that, three days later, the dendritic field begins to retract and shrink. And what she showed was that with application of insulin, whether injected into the animal or given as eye drops, you actually see that there's regeneration of the dendrites. And so this is super exciting. And I emailed her before this, this talk, and she told me at this stage what they're doing is trying to figure out the best formulation for those insulin drops. And they're starting a study in the University of Montreal to study the safety of this in patients. So I think once that safety study is done, then it, potentially there will be a multi-center study looking at at its potential um, efficacy. So axon regeneration is obviously an area of supreme interest. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the challenge is huge. We have to grow the axon, all the, the axon has to regenerate all the way from the retina back to the brain. This is just showing the visual cortex, but actually the ganglion cells will um, travel long distances to many different targets within the brain. So what are some of the challenges of axon regeneration? Well, some of them include the fact that you need to be able to regenerate. The axons are, have, there's lots of factors in that environment that, per, that inhibit regeneration. Um, there's scarring that can inhibit growth. And then what can happen is, is that the axons can regenerate, but then go the wrong way. They can actually turn back even and start growing in the wrong direction. Um, and then how are we gonna get the axons to go to the appropriate targets in the brain? Here we're showing multiple targets, as I mentioned. It doesn't just go to the visual cortex, these uh, ganglion cells. And so how do we get the right axons to go to the right part of the brain, and then when they go to the right part of the brain, how do we get them to connect with their appropriate partners or their, their favorite partners? So this is work done by Dr. Andy Huberman, who I mentioned earlier, where they essentially did both a genetic manipulation, but also what was exciting about this study was the visual stimulation. And in this case, the animals were shown a high contrast visual stimulation um, after the optic nerve crush injury. And what they found was that um, they, could, they were able to promote long, longer distance axon regeneration. Let me take a step back one moment. Um, work prior to Dr. Dr. Huberman's work was done by Dr. Larry Benowitz's lab, where they showed that promoting some inflammation as well as manipulating, doing some molecular manipulations, they were able to promote axon regeneration in the mouse, actually to many targets in the mouse brain. And that was super exciting already. And what um, and Dr. Huberman's contribution was here was to show that that visual stimulation promoted even longer distance axon regeneration. So here, the yellow cells are the cells that are injured, and um, with the visual stimulation, he could make them more active, and then they could extend beyond these sort of injured ganglion cells that weren't responsive to the visual stimulation. And he actually, that picture I showed you earlier was him wearing a virtual reality headset, because now at Stanford, he's doing a study where they're trying to figure out whether visual stimulation using that virtual reality platform could potentially restore sight in glaucoma patients. I mean, still early days, um, and I um, can't show you the video here, but it's very interesting. It's basically you're walking through an art gallery, and then there's white um, uh, um, flashes of um, light that are um, stimulating, and, and um, I think it's, you know, it's too early to tell what, what that's really going to do and whether or not that will be um, beneficial um, for restoring sight, but I think it's definitely an, a very interesting approach and exciting to see work that's been done in the animals go um, to patients. So other advances, I just wanted to highlight briefly um, some of the um, new Catalyst for a Cure members contributions to the field. Shin Duan, who's one of my um, colleagues at UCSF in my department, has shown that um, a specific type of ganglion cell has more regenerative potential compared to other subtypes. Young Hu, who is at Stanford, he's shown that um, molecular manipulation of growth and survival pathways can promote 
axon regeneration. I mentioned Larry Benowitz a little bit earlier, and I think also what's interesting in his work is that um, he's showing that actually other cell types, multiple cell types, have a role in ganglion cell survival and axon regeneration. And Jeff Goldberg in some earlier work showed that, K K and he was also a catalyst for a cure member, um, showed that KLF4 is an important regulator of axon regeneration. So I'm running out of time, but um, I will, so I might go a little bit faster through here, um, but I wanted to just briefly touch upon these last two um, topics. So stem cells are an interesting and exciting part of the research uh, portfolio. And stem cells, I think, there's two things I wanted to share with you about stem cells. The first is that the eye is a super place, super exciting place to study stem cells. And actually the eye was the first place in which human induced pluripotent stem cell derived cells were actually transplanted for the first time in patients. Like what I mean by that is um, it's the first cell type to get transplanted into patients. You know, not muscle, not um, um, cardiac, just an eye. That was the first demonstration that we could take induced pluripotent stem cell derived cells and put them into a living person. And that was for retinal pigment epithelium, RPE cells, which line the back of the retina for patients with macular degeneration or inherited retinal diseases. The second thing I wanted to say about um, stem cells is that stem cells are, of course, they're exciting because you think of them as cell replacement therapies. Um, but they're also important because I think you can use them to study um, and make disease models. Um, for example, for retinal ganglion cells, we really don't have a great cell culture system or cell line to study, but these induced pluripotent stem cell derived ganglion cells may fill that niche. And the second thing is that we can use it for high throughput drug screening if you have a lot of cells to be able to work with. So the approaches to cure glaucoma with stem cells are to use it to restore trabecular meshwork function and outflow, as well as to restore retinal ganglion cell function. And as I mentioned earlier, also to model glaucoma and to use it for drug screening. Um, for restoring trabecular meshwork, right, that's the part of the eye that um, we think is not functioning well in terms of regulating eye pressure. And Mary Kelly, Dr. Mary Kelly at OHSU um, in Oregon has demonstrated that she can take um, um, stem cell derived trabecular meshwork like cells and um, transplant them and also in a perfusion model system demonstrate that it actually improves outflow. For the um, ganglion cells, which is my area of interest, what's been shown is that we can, um, um, or Dr. Meyer can recapitulate the retina using retinal organoids. And so what you're seeing here is this basically this ball of cells that he's coaxed into expressing markers of ganglion cells here on the inside. Um, lighted in green, and then also on the outside, the photoreceptors in red. So that sort of recapitulates, um, in some senses, the organizational structure of the eye, because the ganglion cells are in the inner retina, the photoreceptors are, on the, are in the outer retina. And then this is just a beautiful image showing, again, the, that architecture with the cells in red being the ganglion cells. So just to give you a little, um, I think, uh, understanding of where we are on cell-based therapies for eye disease overall, um, there are stem cell or cell-based therapies that are moving into clinical trials. The challenge in glaucoma is just a lot harder. Like if you imagine a photoreceptor transplantation problem, there you have just a short distance. You just have to transplant the photo, I mean there's also, it's a big challenge too, but you have to transplant the photoreceptors and then they just have to connect to their partners right there. Whereas with the ganglion cells, of course, we have to get them all the way back to the brain. And so the two areas, again, are trabecular their meshwork cells where we have preclinical animal data as well as trans there are lots of studies which I haven't had a chance to talk about with transplantation to ganglion cells. And I'll just say the last bit about whole eye transplant, because if you told me like five to 10 years ago, I would have said, what? I mean, even when I heard about it, I was like, I said, what? So this is a picture of my daughter doing, um, doing eye surgery on her doll. But actually, <laughs> that, that was actually a weekend where I was um, stuck taking care of some um, 
uh, patients, emergency patients in the operating room. So she was asking me what was, what was I doing. Challenges of whole eye transplant are obviously extremely daunting. And I wanted to leave you with this just because I think it's going to take a huge team of people to try to figure out optic nerve regeneration, trying to figure out how we can get the right connections back online. We have to be able to suppress the immune system. And we have to be able to optimize the surgical technique. And it takes a team. And um, this team in, is actually larger than the people here that I've um, I'm highlighting. Rob Nichols is using a special, I call it a special sauce, based on pioneering work that was done at his institution, the University of Wisconsin, to preserve the, the, the ganglion cells in, in the best manner during that time before a whole eye transplant could take place. And then um, this is actually Dr. Kia Washington, who's a plastic surgeon. And the idea here with whole eye transplant is that you're going to have to do, um, it's, this is primarily funded by the Department of De Defense. You can imagine that soldiers out on the battlefield have a lot of traumatic injury. Um, and patients who might require a hemifacial transplant, um, you could also try to um, transplant the eye at the same time. And, um, the idea being that you're going to uh, attempt to re-anastomose the important blood vessels, to pro supply the appropriate blood vessels, and of course the optic nerve regeneration part is, is a huge challenge. So thank you so much for your time. This is my group um, in San Francisco who work with me and, and, and um, have been wonderful collaborators and supporters. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No, I okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>